Generosity and giving have been a part of human culture for centuries. Africa is a host of diverse generosity traditions that have shaped why and how people gave. Many of these traditions are rooted in religious beliefs, cultural values, and societal norms. Today, these dynamics play a significant role in how philanthropy connects with other players in the development ecosystem. This episode takes us on a journey of reflection, highlighting some differences and connections across various giving traditions and how they continue to shape the narrative and place of philanthropy in Africa. Welcome to the Ubuntu Giving Podcast. Welcome to the Ubuntu Podcast by Giving Tuesday Africa Hub. I'm your host, Pidemi Adedire. This podcast is designed to tell stories of generosity in Africa in an engaging manner. And we are featuring guests from all walks of life that will share their experiences and insights on different themes relating to giving. Today, we have an amazing guest, Halima. She's a renowned philanthropy consultant and researcher. She has explored multiple forms of organic and institutional giving traditions and systems across the continent. So I can tell you that you are in good hands. Welcome, Halima. Thank you, Bidemi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for hosting me. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for, you know, agreeing to make a podcast appearance. I mean, I would love to, I'm going to pass the mic back to you so you can share more information about what you do, you know, all the things you've been doing and the organizations you're affiliated with. Sure, thank you. So um, I wear several hats. Um, as you mentioned, I am an independent uh researcher and consultant, and I spend a lot of my time uh, looking at issues of African philanthropy and philanthropy on the continent with a specific focus on narratives, agency, and power. I'm currently a Trust Africa Senior Fellow in African Philanthropy. I'm also a research associate at the Center for African Philanthropy and Social Investment, and I'm affiliated to both the Philanthropy for Social Justice and Peace Working Group, as well as um, a, a member of the Alliance Editorial Board and the ICNL um, Advisory Committee. Um, so I have different, you know, fingers in different spaces, which is great because it helps to link and connect and um, uh, helps to give kind of an overview um, on the space and what's happening. Right. Thank you so much, Halima, for giving us such a clear description. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to how this session pans out. But before we go into the agenda of today, you know, we would like to do a fun exercise with you. Um, this is something that we are going to be doing with all of our guests and any of our podcast episode. So there are four questions, but I'm just going to pick two. The first one would be, what does generosity mean to you? I would love to hear, you know, your definition of generosity. And then for the other questions, I'm actually going to allow you to pick one out of who is the most generous person you've met and what act of generosity have you received that you've never forgotten? So let's start from the top. What does generosity sure. mean to you? Um, generosity means giving, um, and giving can take many forms. It's giving of the self, giving of time, giving of assets, giving of money, but just really it's about, it's about giving of the self. And I think that's where it starts. Um, we always talk about, um, you know, in the Northern discourse, we talk about philanthropy as the love of humanity. And we talk about Ubuntu and we talk about, I am because you are, um, and we talk about all of these notions of of solidarity and so for me generosity really links on the African continent uh, and to me personally to issues of solidarity and our collective humanity. Amazing amazing which of the questions I shared with you Ella would you like to speak to? Who is the most generous person? I think hands down it has to be my mom. Wow. <laughs> Tell I us grew about up her. in a family. <laughs> I grew up in a family and both my parents actually um where giving was just an everyday part of life. Uh, wow. We'd often have people we didn't know staying at our house for weeks and months. My dad would be out at all hours of the day or the night, you know, helping people doing things, getting someone out of jail, taking someone to the hospital, wow. um, helping refugees who were coming in. 
um, you know, when my when my my dad passed for years after, we had people coming to tell us about things that he did that we never knew about. My mom's just, you know, our house is an open door. People walk in and out whenever they need anything from a from a meal to a place to stay to advice to, you know, just some solace and comfort. Um, and she's just she really is the most giving person I know. She she loves her life in service of others, and that has been so inspiring to me. But it's also been so influential in how I think about giving and what we mean by philanthropy. Um, you know, and it's not that she doesn't do the other philanthropic stuff. So. She donates money, she donates assets, she does all of that. But wow. the giving, giving of herself, I think, has been um, the biggest thing that I have learned from her. I mean, it makes sense that you are in the development sector. It makes sense that you're such a, like you're such a big part of philanthropy in Africa. This is amazing. And it's also surprising how most of the people we've asked this question always say their mom is the most generous person they've met. It's really beautiful to hear all of these stories. Okay, so moving forward now, let's dive into the agenda of the day. Uh, let's talk about giving traditions in Africa. Can you share with us what some common giving traditions are and how they've evolved? Sure. You know, we, we, I mentioned earlier about Ubuntu as an overall phase, but African giving systems are both simple and nuanced, as we can see in some of the terminology I'll talk about. Um, you know, Africa is characterized by both commonality as well as heterogeneity. So there are definitely traditions and practices that share common characteristics, but there are also very specific traditions that are a culmination of historical, social, religious, cultural uh, contexts that uh, are informed by uh, movements of people across space of time that are informed by so many different kinds of elements. Um, before we get to the traditions, we must look at the notion of giving in Africa. So terms like Ubuntu, Rubachiro, Unsendo, they're all linked to the idea of collective humanity. Terms like Undungu, Ujama, Teranga, they're all linked to notions of brotherhood or support. Uh, terms like Tarkifaya, Kusadiana, linked to notions of duty to support each other. So there's a huge range of terms across the African continent that talk about this notion of solidarity, notion of duty, notion of reciprocity, this notion of collective humanity. And then within these, we see a range of actions that share both similar characteristics, but also have their own nuanced expression. So for example, when people pool labor in the agricultural season or for construction, in some places it's called Aro, in some Mrimo, in some Ilimo, depending on where you are. In Ilimo, the food and drink is also provided during that space, um, during that um, uh, that action, um, and in others it may not. So, specific terminology is used to distinguish different kinds of of giving systems. Um, there's ukusisa, which is a lending of productive assets, where the recipient keeps the fruit of the assets, and we see that in different places. Uh, ukubona is a Zulu tradition of visiting the ill, which is also seen as a form of saraka in Islam. Um, there's also support without necessarily expecting reciprocity. So there's a term called ukuanena, where the giver knows they're giving something that may not be returned, but gives it anyway. Or on jambi, which is support for the aged and sick, which is, a, you know, these actions have specific terminologies. There's support in time of mourning or death called pataka or chema or zipute, depending on where you are. Um, support not just for immediate issues, but also for long-term asset building. And for long-term productivity, wakakheri, ukusisa, serakajaria, to name wow. we all know, you know, we, we could go on. Um, the list that we have is amazing, but I don't think it touches a fraction of the things that we know. There are so Indeed. many giving traditions that exist that I think we need to do much more um, investigation on. Indeed, indeed. Um, I mean, I wish there's a book that one could read that has like in-depth um, definitions and descriptions of all of these traditions across different countries. So there are some traditions, for example, I'm, I'm in Nigeria, I'm from Nigeria, mm -hmm. that feels now, now that I'm in the development sector, they feel a lot more like giving traditions. For example, the Umoko mm -hmm. culture where um, a young mother right someone who has just given birth mm -hmm. is given all the care and yes. help she can get and you know postpartum care which is amazing yes or, 
Oh, mm-hmm. ha- and we 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 have. I think there's another one called the Ajo. Um, it's kind of like a collective pause that helps people to get funding in time and then people yeah. kind of get the funds that they need when it's their turn I mean so many so mm-hmm. many examples that I can talk about and I currently in my family where I'm from like my very small village in Nigeria if if someone dies say an elderly person I think everyone mm-hmm. home and abroad they get the news and without even being asked or being told, we kind of just yes. contribute in some way, money, mm-hmm. food, everything that we can think of or things that we're able to give. We just put all those things together to make the burial ceremony really, really, you know. Yeah. Right. So now mm-hmm. I'm realizing that these are giving traditions as well. I just, I just wish that there is more spotlight on these traditions. Because even to our villages, to very little parts and corners of the world in Africa, um, mm-hmm. these traditions are being seen on a daily. Um, I, I want to ask, how yeah. does these different values and beliefs, how do they shape our daily given practices in Africa? So I think a lot of our of African giving, and I said this, there's... Um, commonality but there's also heterogeneity but a lot of the values around organic African giving are rooted in uh, well a lot of the practices of African giving are rooted in values of solidarity of collective humanity of reciprocity and those shape how giving is not just um, it's not transactional you know, how giving is not just something that happens when you have access. It's about something gets that gets done as a part of your everyday life. It's about something that you do even when you don't have or you do with what it is that you do have. I think um, some of these values are about, you know, there are conversations around obligation and, you know, giving is a tax. But I think there are also really, really important conversations about giving a solidarity and how giving is a form of, of identity and collective identity and how giving is used to maintain um, cohesion. So I think in many, many places we see um, giving traditions and behaviors that are reciprocal in nature, but also are not reciprocal in nature. Um, and I think we can't just generalize, though reciprocity is um, a very important part, but reciprocity is also a factor in institutionalized giving and, and the notions that reciprocity, the idea of reciprocity should make something be excluded from a giving framing is really, really problematic. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of taking notes because you, you shared a sure. lot of, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm here in terms like collective identity, solidarity, mm-hmm. um, for the benefit of people that do not understand some of these terms and, you know, some of the listeners we're trying to attract, what would you, def- how would you define rather solidarity and then collective identity? So I think solidarity is simply saying I stand with you. You know, if we if we want to simplify it, is I I am with you. I am where you are. You know, I will help with what you need. And what people can give differs at different points in time. But there are practices and 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 traditions in African society. So when when people um, get together and pool their labor to plow the land of someone who is old or who is sick. They're standing in solidarity with the person they know cannot do, but they cannot allow their neighbor to go hungry while while they are fine or the neighbor's land to be, you know, unplowed while they are okay. And so it's a, it's a notion of saying we're in this together. And that links to, you know, our collective identity. We're here as a community. Giving in Africa is very, very kinship related, very community based as a start. It's not the only kind of giving that happens, but a lot of organic giving is very kinship based. And it's about um, this notion of Ubuntu. I am because you are. I, um, I, I see myself together with you. My progress and your progress are intertwined. My liberation and your liberation is intertwined. So I think this collective identity of us as a unit, as a community, as a people is a very strong 
element in many parts uh, of, of the roots of African giving. I hear you. Thank you so much, Halima. Um, let's talk a bit about heterogeneity of giving. I don't know if I'm pronouncing mm-hmm. that word right. So yes. um, could you like give us the definition just after, as you've simplified collective identity and solidarity, and then we delve deep into the heterogeneity of African giving? Sure, just as heterogeneity means that there's many different elements to it. It doesn't look the same. So it's often that we talk about African giving and we just say Ubuntu, but actually it's so much more nuanced. You know, when I, I talked of all of these different kinds of, of giving practices. So giving looks, it shares some common roots, but it can also look very different depending on who you are, on where you are, on your geographic context. Um, you know, we think about uh, there's a there's a very um, uh, there are many diaspora communities in South Africa, and I've just um, done a paper on Muslim philanthropy in South Africa, and one of the things that I looked at was how does giving play out in different diaspora communities, um, and it's really fascinating to see the differences, how when people have migrated influences what their giving looks like in relation to where they are and what their giving looks like in relation to what was home, whether that is still home, whether it is not, uh, what those different waves of migration, for example, have meant for how, where people direct their giving or um, how people have linked into solidarity networks here in the country, both um, including people that are from their home country, as well as solidarity networks of people who are South African. Um, and different, you know, different people have found different kinds of connections and and give differently based on, on how they locate themselves, based on their positioning. I think given just, we should not make the mistake of saying, oh, it's African giving and it's just African giving. There's so much of nuance and richness the different types and traditions of African giving. And I think if we have to um, open up the lens for how we understand philanthropy, because we've tended to look at philanthropy from a very northern lens, giving is top-down, professionalized money, rich to poor. If we take that lens away and we allow ourselves some imagination and you look at it from an anthropological point of view, for example, you will start to see those behaviors that you identify as giving, you know, the bathing of, of a deceased body. You know, somebody does that, and it's often the same people who are doing that. The, the helping a newborn mom um, look after an infant child because she doesn't really know what to do. There, there are certain people in our communities who do that. Um, the visiting the ill, you know. So I think that there's just such a variety of, different traditions that we think about when we talk about African giving systems. And we should not make the mistake of simplifying it and just saying, oh, it's Ubuntu or, oh, it's Taranga. Um, I think we have to be able to understand nuance and complexity here. Thank you, Halima. Um, why do you think African giving systems, or do you think, and why have African okay. giving systems been marginalized? in philanthropic discussions? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question, but uh, I'm glad you've asked it. Um, philanthropy is a fairly new field of study on the African continent. And for a very long time, um, it was, you know, the focus, whenever we learned about philanthropy, we went outside of the continent to learn about philanthropy. Whenever we read knowledge on philanthropy, we looked for people outside the continent who wrote that, who developed that knowledge. Um, Whenever we wanted to set up systems, we looked at what was happening in the global north. And so over, over, you know, in terms of the institutionalized philanthropy space and the formal field of philanthropy, we've kind of imported notions of philanthropy that focus on top-down, professionalized, institutionalized, monetary-based systems. This is the dominant philanthropy narrative in the global north but it's not our dominant practice. And over the last 15 to 20 years, we've started to see significant knowledge building and advocacy, trying to develop a deeper understanding of African philanthropy narratives. 
Now, there's been a lot, you know, there's been publications, there has been advocacy, there has been conferences, there's been a lot of work that has been done by a core group of people on this. Um, but despite this work, there's, I think that the reason why this narrative is still marginalized is because there are fundamental tensions and differences with the existing dominant narrative of philanthropy. And I'll talk to some of them. One is the degree of separation. The dominant narrative of philanthropy talks about giving as giving to a stranger. So you get these global surveys that, that measure um, how giving a country is based on, you know, one of the questions they ask is how many times have you given to a stranger? But on the African continent, that is not the question because we are socialized to give to those closest to us first. Our family members, our neighbors, our community members, those that we have um, relationships of kinship with. And so we give and we have extended family members. The notion of family in Africa is very different to the notion of family in the United States, for example. Um, you know, your, your father's brother's son is your brother. You know, he's not seen as your cousin. How do we start to unpack giving, kinship-related giving and community-based giving as giving when it's not to your immediate family? So I think this degree of separation is something that's a fundamental narrative tension. The second one is around institutionalization. The Global North is focused very much on institutionalized and highly structured uh, giving systems. Um, and in Africa, we do have both individual and associational fora. We have loosely organized and highly structured, but they're not always legally constituted. They may be strategic, they may be organized, but they not, may not be legally constituted. And so they're not recognized as institutions, even though they are de facto institutions. And on the African continent, money is just one part of our giving systems. But should all of our giving be equated to money, I think, um, is a very big question. So we express our giving in different ways, and we can't use monetary measurements to express those. And so there's a, a big tension there. Um, religious giving, for example, religious giving is significant driver and motivator on this continent, both to religious organizations, but also to religiously inspired development organizations. And I think those get left out of the conversation because they, they simply get lumped in with um, missionary kind of work. Um, but those organizations are really recognized as philanthropic organizations, even on the continent. Um, another important thing is this, this issue of reciprocity, which I mentioned earlier. African giving is steeped in notions of reciprocity and mutual support. But in the Northern discourse, reciprocity is seen as being as fundamental odds with altruism. But reciprocity is very, very prevalent in the global North. When you give and you get a tax break, there's a reciprocal benefit. When you give to a university and your name goes on a building, there's a reciprocal benefit. Um, you know, when you do corporate social investment and you get marketing kudos, there's a reciprocal benefit. So I think we have to start to talk to those double standards about how these kinds of issues are used to marginalize and make African giving systems lesser than. Um, you know, there are many others. How do we understand remittances? People just, right. you know, in the Northern framing, remittances are just assumed to be remittances to immediate family, but remittances themselves are complex and used for many different things. So I think that there are some fundamental tensions um, between what the Northern narrative sees as the core elements of philanthropy, and those are very different to our narrative. And I've part of what I've been advocating is not only that we need to amplify our African narratives of giving, but that we need a new global narrative of giving because there are other cultures across the world that are rooted in notions of collective humanity. You can find them in Indonesia, you can find them in India, you can find them in Latin America. And so I do really think that we need to not just be talking about uh, advancing African narratives of giving, but really about advancing a new global definition that's rooted in multiple geographies. Absolutely, a new global definition. Because I was, I was just about to ask that, you know, the fact <laughs> that some of our current structures do not feel or look like that of the global not does that take away the legitimacy <laughs> of our giving, you know? And is there a way we could 
create our own structure, something that feels like us, that is easy to understand and strengthen African philanthropy as it is. How can we begin to own our own stories and cultures of giving? Where do we start from in shifting these narratives? You know, the, I think the first thing is to, to recognize that we already have our own structures. They're there, they've been there for an age old time. You know, and yes, as as the world moves, we are developing new ones as well. But many of the old ones still remain. And I think there's this tendency to want to formalize and organize and professionalize organic systems, which is very, very dangerous because we we risk destroying them. And so I do think that the starting point is by not trying to turn everything into what a northern philanthropic institution looks like. Why should that be our goal? So I do think recognizing and validating the existence of these organizations and understanding their value and the roles that they play um, is really, really important. I think that we need to have greater awareness and appreciation of our systems of giving. We need to increase our knowledge building uh, to look at the different kinds of giving practices. We need to make visible through different kinds of media, written, oral, multimedia, Stories that capture the diversity of oral giving, of giving traditions. We need to explore knowledge produced from other disciplines, but use a philanthropy angle. So I, I'm convinced that there's much that is written about giving in Africa. It's just not written from a philanthropy perspective. So if we go look at anthropological studies of societies across the continent and in their descriptions of the kinds of traditions, we will find many giving behaviors, but it's never been described as philanthropic. Um, and I think it requires us to suspend what we know, to suspend the frameworks that we've been taught and to really think differently about uh, how do we use different lenses to understand giving. Honestly, Alima, I'm tempted to talk about philanthropy telling. <laughs> <laughs> as a new episode or something where we can really talk about how we tell our stories of giving right mm -hmm. the awareness mm -hmm. I would love yeah. to throw more spotlights on simple acts of giving you know I, I mm -hmm. remember when my grandma came visiting and I took my phone and decided to record a video of her just telling me how you oh. know her uh, relationship with our choir, she's still in the choir, by the way, with our choir members, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that everyone is always in our home trying to charge their mm -hmm. phone. She's the only one with power, constant power supply. So you can imagine how, you know, our home is. So it would be nice if yeah. we can throw, you know, greater awareness around this simple, mm -hmm. seemingly, permit me to use the word, ordinary acts of giving and knowing fully well that these are things that we can still tell and call them part of philanthropy. Thank you so much, Halima. Thank you for helping me understand giving traditions because I do not know a lot about giving traditions. And this is speaking from someone who has spent most of her life in Nigeria. And I love that I could relate to a lot of the traditions that you've mentioned. So we are truly mm -hmm. grateful. Uh, and I was going to say you should share one last, you know, comment on this topic. What's the way forward and um, some of the things you would like to see in the sector? Final comment. Final comment. There is no one story of giving. There are multiple stories. Let's tell our stories. We have a rich history of oral, a uh, rich tradition of oral histories. Let's capture our stories. Let's talk to our moms, to our grandmothers. Let's talk to people in our communities, our neighborhoods. Let's find out how, how giving is embedded in their everyday lives. And let's tell these stories because that's what's going to give life to it. Thank you so much, Halima. As we conclude this episode of Ubuntu Giving Podcast, let's remember the power of generosity in fostering a sense of community, interconnectedness amongst individuals and communities. Join us in our next episode as we explore the fascinating world of generosity and giving in Africa. Thank you for listening and do have a wonderful rest of day.
Thank you.